So today we'll be covering chapter 12, um, marriage and family. And in chapter one, I asked you guys a question, you know, what is marriage or what does it consider? What is a family type aspects, right? <clears throat> and when we're talking about marriage, there's different types of marriages, right? There's different types of norms and values type aspects. Um, so what is a family, what is marriage and what's common between culture themes, right? So family is basically two or more people, you know, who consider themselves related by blood, marriage, or adoption. Um, typical family. However, when you're looking at a household, and sometimes people, you know, confuse family and household sometimes, but a household is just basically people who occupy the same housing unit. Doesn't mean that you're actually family, it just means you're living together. Um, the other um, Sometimes, you know, if you've been like maybe your mom and dad's longest family friend and you might call them aunt and uncle, that would be part of, you know, you consider them family, but in reality, they're really not. That's like a more or less of like an extended family. Um, so you have a nuclear family, which is your tight, you know, knitted, common, consisting of your, you know, husband and wife and children. And then you have your extended family, which could be relatives such as older generations, unmarried aunts and uncles and that type of aspects, you know, your grandparents, those are your extended. So when you're looking at family, family could be huge, it could be small, it could be different type of, you know, aspects. When you're looking at marriage, you have two types of marriages, right? You have polygamy, which is a form of marriage in which men have more than one wife. You have polyandry, which women have more than one husband, which that's not something you hear too often of. Um, you have your typical marriage, which is just the one wife, one husband. Um, you have different culture themes when it comes to this. We talked about the exogamy and the in, in um, the exo the endogamy and stuff like that. Um, we'll get into endogamy, um, but when we're looking at marriages, you know, and we're looking at families, is family universal? If you think about it, you know, um, families are university are universal. There's a variety of different forms of families. Um, but they're hard to define as well because depending on how big your family is, the more relationship you have, there's a lot that goes on within it, within that family unit. So when you're looking at family, you have this, you know, and especially if you put in the polygamy and the polyandry. So if you have a family that has more than one wife, you know, how are you going to adjust for the actual family life because now you don't fit that typical universal family life. Um, the other is if you are a polyandry where you're a wife that has multiple husbands, same thing. You don't fit that typical life. It's very hard to define in that type of aspects. In some cultures, it's okay to have these types of, you know, types of families and types of marriages. Um, in other cultures, it is not. It's kind of frowned upon and kind of weird. When we're looking at marriages, um, same thing. They're hard to define. They're, they're unique type aspects. Um, they're still universal. Um, marriage is marriage. It, marriage exists across all societies, right? Um, recognizing the same sex marriages. It regulates uh, popular sex relationships. And there are some universal properties, but like I mentioned, when it comes to some marriages, you have endogamy, which is the practice of marrying within one's own group. This is um, like when we discuss the Indians um, aspects, if you are um, dialect or not, those were, you know, you have to marry within your own group. That is an endogamy. When you're looking at an exogamy, these are the practices of marrying outside of one group. So, you know, tend us as U.S., we tend to marry, you know, kind of all over the place. We don't stay within our own aspects. However, you end up with incest taboo. And if you don't know what incest is, this is marrying like your relative, you know, um, there's more into it. So when you're looking at universal properties there, no, there is not universal, but marriage and 
as for the existence of marriage, yes, it, it exists in every society. It doesn't matter, but we have some possible aspects to make sure that we don't fall into a role confusion and stuff like that. So when we're looking at common culture themes, so the characteristics versus traditional versus industrial, um, post, you know, industrialized, you know, and post-industrialized societies, you know, what is a marriage structure? Um, when we're looking at traditional societies, um, extended marriage, you know, spouse, large kinship network, you know, um, now that was more traditional, extended family. Now with the um, industrialized and post-industrialized society, um, nuclear kind of marriage brings fewer obligations towards the spouse relatives, where and before um, when you kind of got married, it kind of extended out to the family as well. So they always say whoever you're married, you're marrying your family as well. Old sayings. That's traditional sayings. Now it's more of a nuclear. Now it's just, you know, it's, you have fewer obligations in regards to taking everybody. Um, what are the functions of marriage? Um, traditionally, you have the encompassing. There's six functions listed underneath the functional perspective, which we'll get into this. Um, but not only that, it's, you know, when you're looking at the industrialization of things, it, it's more limited how many functions are fully by the, you know, the, the aspects of marriage. Um, when we're looking at from the function side of things, what do we really need, you know, what is marriage really the purpose of, if you really want to think about it? So we, like I said, we get into that theoretical perspective, which is a functional side. <clears throat> Who holds authority? Um, traditionally, authority is held by males. Um, now that, you know, things are kind of industrialized, it's more divided and more equal. How many spouses at one time? Um, you have the monogamy, which is one spouse, or you have the, the um, polygamy, which is multiple, or polyandry, depending on what way. Um, more traditional and more post-industrialized societies is usually one spouse. When you looked at characteristics, um, traditionally parents, usually the father used to select the spouse, the wife, um, vice versa. If, you know, the father of the daughter usually had to give the approval before, now it's individual choice. Um, couples usually, um, once they did reside, resided with the groom's family, now they usually end up having their own residence before they even get married. This is that cohabitation I've been talking about throughout some of these chapters. Um, <clears throat> the your distant figures like you're from your male ancestors your kinships um, commonly a female ancestors you know um, they're not all equal they're not really a separation where before when it came to certain things certain values males would have more say than females type aspects the the figure wise um, inheritance <clears throat> excuse me used to be a rigid system of rules usually you know depending on the kinships that you would kind of rule in regards to the inheritance type aspects. And now it's just really highly individualistic. Um, it's usually bilinear as well, but it just really depends in regards to how your family is set up, how big is your family and that type of aspects. So these are just some com like common culture themes. Some of this stuff still stands in place, traditional societies, regardless of the industrialization kind of keep that in mind so when you're looking at marriage what is marriage you know it's basically a group's approval mating arrangements usually marked by a ritual of some sort you know um, you have some type of a ceremony to show that bond with one another so by all means <clears throat> how do we make sure though we don't you know kind of cross our lines um, so we look at the kind of different systems you know why is the family um why is family you know is universal why is it universal you know if you look from a functionalist side of things you know we have um like i said six ways you know we look at family as an eco economic production we look at it as a socialization of our children right we care for the sick and the aged we look at it as, you know, possible of a recreation type aspects. We look at it for sexual control and we look at it for reproduction. 
those are the six factors that we looked at universal for families, right? This is our goal. This is what we want. We, some people want small families. Some people want big families, just depending on how you, you know, how well you are on average. Right now, women only want maybe one or two kids where in the past we've seen that it was bigger families, one in four or five kids. So it was one of those things to where, you know, fam that, that makes family the more of the universal. When we're looking at the function of the incest taboo, this is where the functionalists note that the incest taboo helps families to avoid world confusion. Um, incest taboo is basically where you're marrying within your own family and marrying your brother, marrying your sister, marry that aspects, right? So when it comes to incest taboo, you have this form of role confusion. So functionalist perspective said that incest taboo helps family to avoid this role confusion. And the reason why that is, is because it makes parents socialize their children for who they are. So if father is a dad, right? You socialize yourself as a dad. Um, daughter is a daughter, son's a son, mom's a mom. You don't cross those lines. When you cross those lines is when you have that incest taboo. Um, so from a functionalist tab, you know, a functionalist standpoint, they say incest taboo helps family. The term of helps family control or avoid that role confusion, right? Because we socialize ourselves by our roles. <clears throat> the other thing is isolation and emotional overload. Um, from a functionalist side, they analyze dissatisfactions. Um, they look at the possibility of isolations in a nuclear family creates one of a, basically a dysfunction. Um, extended families, large kinship networks, those types of things could also cause a little bit of a dysfunction of isolation. Could also cause emotional overload. Um, if you feel like you have to um, satisfy and make others happy all the time, that could give you a complete emotional overload. Or if you feel like you're being judged or that type of aspects, and or if you feel like, you know, maybe your in-laws don't like you, you know, that's a huge factor in regards to some of that. So the, it's kind of like they consider that the dark side in your book, that's emotional overload for some people um, when you're looking at from a marriage family type aspects. Conflicts. When you're looking at conflicts, you're going to have conflicts regardless of husband and wife, the struggles in between, even within a family, you're going to have conflicts. It's just natural. It's going to happen. There's nothing you could do without it, right? Um, despite the couple's best intentions, you know, they're going to arise. It's just going to happen. Um, you're not always going to agree. You're going to have disagreements. Those are the conflicts. It's natural. It's life, right? You could also have changing powers in relationships where the power and the source and such much of the conflict might happen is in regards to the income, job, education. Those things can change the power in a relationship, which then can cause also conflicts, um, you know, or the um, breaking point in regards to having kids, not having kids, those types of things. So these are struggles in between husband and wives. Um, but when you're looking at making the decisions around the house and stuff like that, that could also cause conflict. So a lot of times wives end up making more decisions than men. Um, couples that divide the decisions, you can kind of see it's about 30% where women actually make the majority of the decisions is about 43. And then you can see the husbands that make more of the decisions is 26. And I use this as an example. If you think about it, who did you always run to to ask for help or if you needed something? It's usually mom. Um, mom, I need a ride. Mom, can I go here? Mom, can I do this? Mom, can I do that? It was never dad. So if you think about it, that mom is making the decisions. So this kind of chart kind of shows that, you know, it's that kind of aspects. It's the, they make the majority of the decisions within the home. <clears throat> when we're looking at the symbolic interactions of perspectives in regards to gender and housework and childcare aspects, um, Changes in traditional generational orientation has, it's changing. Um, paid work and housework is also changing. Um, more child care, obviously daycare, nannies, whatever is also coming in effect. Total hours, we'll kind of see the division of that. And then the gender division in regards to labor, like who does what type of aspects. So when we're talking about the changes within the traditional gender, um, 
you had an opening vignette in regards to examining gender roles apart from just special mentions you know it's one of those you know housework child care those types of things um, if a woman works they're still expected to maintain the house take care of the kids that type of thing um, however the gender orientation is kind of shifting a little bit to where if you have both male and female both working they kind of tend to balance a little bit more but still when it comes to the like I said the the child care and the housework aspects you still have women that are still on the higher side and along with paid work um, that are in there as well so when you're looking at the aspects of how this all plays together when you're looking at a two paycheck marriage and how do wives and husbands divide the responsibilities this is what i was just talking about a lot of times men still work you know the 40 plus hours a week whereas women only work you know anywhere from 24 25 maybe 30 hours a week so it really depends but as you can see the household chores are still divided but women are still doing more and when it comes to child care once again women are still doing more excuse me <clears throat> however when you're this is from 2008 this is a long time of statistics here nowadays um when you're looking at this women aren't working 24 hours anymore women are working more hours um so when you take this it has to come from here and here when you're working more hours right so this is where that daycare and all that kind of comes in but it's still who takes care of these responsibilities so it has to balance somewhere right and this is only showing 60 percent so i mean you, we have some room up here but if you really want to look at it it's kind of one of those situations we'll have to balance a little bit more but the old saying there's only so much time in a day right it is what it is um i kind of chuckle and laugh because i look at this and it's like okay well as i, I work two jobs so it's kind of one of those situations it's like okay i'm i'm up here when it comes to work hours you know i'm just like a guy sometimes you know but i'm still required to do this i don't have any kids to take care of anymore all my kids are adults so it's one of those situations to where you know i still have the household chores but we split those household chores um yeah my kids still live at home but like i said i don't have to take care of them they're all adults um i do have my grandkids here but that's you know not here or there but it's one of those situations to where you fluctuate it always adjusts and moves around when it comes to dividing responsibilities but when you're looking at um you know paid work the more child care um but you got to figure if you an average family if both parents are both doing this and if they're equivalent to the child care and the daycare um what where's the majority of that time for the child being spent you know that's that's the kind of the key here you know we're talking about marriage and we're talking about family type aspects if you have both both mom and dad working 42 hours a week you know when you're looking at household chores and you're looking at child care who's really doing the child care at that point so it makes it kind of hard so it's it's a you know division of labor more or less in regards to the gender so it's just kind of how we do it there's gender division of labor where you kind of split your aspects when you're looking at the family life cycles you have love you have courtship you have global perspectives right um, some global perspectives some cultures you just don't go out and date whoever you want sometimes it's a courtship you're set up to a certain thing you have a chaperone you have aspects in regards you have to follow um when you're looking at it so you have love as an addiction right um you have some type of connection with that end of person um you have a romantic love which is a feeling of erotic attraction right it's one of those situations to where you want to feel like there's a need there's something there that kind of pulls you in um culture variations of love yeah there's tons of culture variation of love um it could be you know uh, no love at all arranged marriages um, there's zero love there you don't know that person so type aspects um, you might even have you know romantic love for somebody else but now you're being forced to marry somebody else so it's kind of you know 
um, culture variations of loves is very, very different. The fear of introduced romantic love is the same thing that ghost falls in line in regards to um, when you're being um, basically fear induced, you need to mirror. I mean, if you think about um, one of the pictures that we saw of the five year old little girl that was being forced to marry, you know, you only saw this portion of her face, right? Um, previous in a previous chapter is that a fear induced romantic love yeah she's married to that person regardless she doesn't have a say she doesn't have a choice she has to build this relationship you know with this basically man she's a child you know so that would be that fear introduced um so it's very hard for some some individuals to kind of get past that and then you know knowing if it doesn't work or making sure that they don't break the rules or break the laws culturally wise don't bring disrespect to their family there's a lot of things that go into that type of aspects when it comes when it talks about the culture variation of love and the fear introduced when we're looking at marriage and we're looking at um Homogamy refers to basically the um, tendency of people with similar characteristics to marry one another. Um, don't ask me why the book uses these two as that definition or term in regards to it, um, but they use these two as an example of the most common pattern of marriages, you know, between African Americans and whites. Yes, yeah, she is white, she's not anything else, but when you're looking at it, they have some similar characteristics. What do they have in common, if you think about it, right? Um, they have certain things they get along with. They have certain aspects that, you know, maybe they predict, you know, social channels or education, social class, you know, race and ethnicities. Uh, these are all types of things that kind of go into that homogamy aspects when we're looking for that other marriage person in a partnership type of, in type way. Um, we want that um, spiritual nearness type aspects. So that's kind of one way how they look at it for marriage. Um, we look for special patterns. Um, we look at all of those different things. So the way how they kind of looked at it, they kind of use race and ethnicity as an example here in regards to kind of seeing how things go. Um, marriages between, because they use the other two as the example. When you look at marriages between whites and African Americans, the race and ethnicity of husband and wife, you can kind of see in 2015, you have more of an acceptance of African American husbands and white women versus white husbands and African American wives. And I've asked this several times, why is this so acceptable? And this is back in 2015. Is this still the case now or has it changed? Um, is this still more of a pattern? Um, is there more of a dramatic effect? Is the marriage between um, one or the other stronger? You know, it's one of those things. Is one more acceptable in society than the other? You know, or is it one more acceptable in the um, extended family aspects than the other? So you kind of have to look at all those factors when you're looking at the the statistical type aspects, you know, why is one more higher than the other? What's the difference? Why is there a difference? Um, like I said, so all those questions, like all those aspects that I just gave you, like all those whys, you know, those are all those topics that kind of come in play that kind of say, why? Um, same thing, you know, you could look at it as white husbands and um, Latino wives or and Latino husbands and white wives me and my husband, that's us, you know, what are more acceptable, what's easier to do, what society accepts, you know, it's all those aspects. Um, when you have those inner relations of, or the, the mixed race and ethnicity couples, there's a lot more factors that go into it, more of the cultural aspects that go into it. When you're looking at childbirth, um, the ideal family size, this is something before you even get married, communicate this please because not everybody has this ideal family size but when you're looking at a number of children that you are looking to have and 
you know, are able to have, there's actually a limit that women can, are able to have, but this is marital satisfaction after childbirth too. You got to have to keep in mind when, every time you add a child, it takes away that intimacy between the husband and wife, because you now, you got responsibilities that are kind of spreading out. So that intimacy level kind of goes. So what is an ideal family size? You know, when you're looking at over the years, large families were huge back in the, in the you know, 1930s, 1966 these these were ideals to have big family remember they were part of the economic family unit to produce they needed large families to make sure that their their economic status their social class status kind of remained where it needed to stay 1973-ish is kind of where it shifted a little bit where smaller families were more idealistic um, and people didn't want big families anymore um, economy changed, things got a little bit more expensive, you know, we had wartime going on, though all that stuff is kind of going on, right? As you can see now, it's still spiking to the point to where having smaller families is really high versus having large families. It's going the complete opposite way where, you know, they're pretty even at some points throughout our years, but at the same time, it's one of those aspects you can also tell through the economy changes. People change. Um, economy wasn't too bad here. It was actually pretty nice. Um, you know, it was one of those situations when you're looking at it, economy now, economy is expensive. To raise a child now is extremely expensive. Um, you know, if diapers, wipes, formula, food, I mean, geez Louise, it, they're expensive. You know, box of diapers on a East side, you know, $17. You know, if you want an expensive side, you're looking at $25. So it really depends. So when you're looking at um, the America's ideal family size, this is kind of like a, a recall from, you know, a previous, you know, our previous chapter from chapter one, you know, in regards to the idealistic of, you know, how many kids you want. This is kind of giving you more of that ideal in regards to it. And like I said, there's been remarkable changes in regards to this as well. Um, in 1976, to have two children was a really low percentage. 2004 was really high. To have four plus 1976 was extremely high. And then 2014, it's really low. So you can kind of see how rules kind of just flip-flopped kind of throughout the time frames. The actually other aspects that's happening in regards to our childbearing type of aspects is, you know, um, basically designer babies. And as bad as I say, when we're looking at the biotechnology and we're looking at technology in general, you are able now to actually um, alter the DNA within a womb um, to make sure that you end up with the child that you actually want. Um, basically, you end up, you have the woman's eggs, it's fertilized with the sperm, a cell is removed from each embryo, um, and then tested for biomarkers um, associated with females, green eyes, blonde hair aspects, right? Only embryos with biomarkers for those required traits are replaced back into the woman's womb, right? And then once she actually conceives, this virtual guarantees virtually guarantees the child will be a female and increases the probability she'll have green eyes and blonde hair. This is kind of more of a technology of, of that bio type aspects that's kind of emerging and is already in effect, by the way. Um, very expensive, not cheap, but it, this is also one of those things that, you know, are you really letting your child have the free characteristics of their culture and you know their inherited physical characteristics are they are they actually being able to do that if you think about it if you are genetically changing those biomarkers to ensure that you are getting what you want well you're also changing the biomarkers for the future of their kids as well um, because you've just taken some of those genes kind of away type of aspects so it's quite um, Side when you're looking at if you're able to adjust this in embryos, what else can you adjust in embryos? You know, um, there's a lot that kind of goes into this as well. They've done extra other research in regards to this type of, not so much of this type of aspects, but in regards to um, 
particular type of diseases type of aspects in regards to like AIDS and stuff like that. So it, it's kind of scary and it's kind of one of those situations to where it it's very nerve wracking to know that technology is going so far to where we could kind of pick and choose what we want our child to look like or, you know, pick and choose in regards to, you know, other items as well. When we're looking at child rearing and we're looking at the marital satisfaction after childbirth and all this aspects, you know, what are some of the satisfactions of after childbirth? You know, we have the happiness increases as the child ages, you know, you go from a dyad from a two person to a triad to a three, um, you know, you have this child rearing type aspects you have to make sure you socialize you have to make sure you do all this stuff right you have to make sure you work on your marriage because it doesn't do it by itself there's a lot of things that go on but you're rearing a child and now your marriage kind of goes and you're done you know now you have an aspect of maybe you have a single dad um, maybe you have custody you know um, custody issues going on maybe you have a single mom maybe you have all of these aspects, right? But when you're looking at this picture and you're looking at child rearing, a single father with custody with his child, with his child or children, um, has you need, you know, very unique role conflicts, right? Um, just what is a mother dad type aspects? Um, you know, I, I see my brother in law. He has a girl. You know, it, it comes a time to where you cannot relate with a little girl. Sorry, guys, you just you can't. Um, there's some emotional things in there that you can't grasp and understand. There's hormones that are going on that are just, they're out of the, even the little girl's hands, you know, it's just one of those things. So it's very hard sometimes for single fathers to grasp this um, and have that role, you know, they, they have that role conflict kind of aspects because they can't relate as a woman. And same thing with single moms, raising single boys, they, they can't relate the other way either. So it's not just dads and daughters, it's moms and sons too. Um, by all means, it's not easy. But when you're raising, you know, children and you're rearing children, you know, there are some role conflicts that go both ways. That's very hard for both sides to kind of relate to, both sides to kind of gather their stuff to get you know gather all the information they really need because like i said for a female relating to a male there's no way for a male to relate to a female there's no way you emphasize or, you know you empathize and you sympathize as much as you can but you're not in those roles to be able to say i know what you're talking about uh, been there done that right you can't say that <clears throat> so when you're when you're looking at rearing children, married couples and single moms, there's a huge difference, right? When you're looking at the the comparison, single fathers, the same thing. Nowadays, you're starting to see more single dads, um, which is cool. It's great. It's one of those situations where statistically, it's going to start shifting some things around to where you're not seeing more single moms. You're starting to see more single dads, which that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, daycare, same thing there's an increase in daycare because obviously if you're a single mom, single dad, even if you are a married couple and both couples are working, the child has to go somewhere. So where does that child go? Does it go to daycare? Does it go to relatives? Does it, where, where, you know, what type of aspects? Does it go to nannies? Nannies aren't cheap either. Um, social classes determine a lot of aspects too. And then helicopter parenting, that's always cool. And that's sarcastic. Um, it's very rough. And I actually seen that one work in real life. And it was kind of trippy to see that kind of aspects. And they're like, oh, the kids don't know. No, the kids knew. Um, and the right way to rare children. What is the right way? Who's the right way? Is there a right way? You know, it's kind of one of those things, you know, I don't need type of aspects. As when you're looking at this, who takes care of the babies while their mothers are at work? So like I said, married couples and single moms, when we're looking at this figure here, we can see that it kind of fluctuates. So married couples, you can see mother cares for the child about 4% of the time, like all day long um, and not, but uh, you know, you have a center-based, you have grandparents, you have those type of aspects, right? Um, if the mother works and maybe the dad doesn't, you can see the father takes care of the child. So you can kind of, this is kind of like a variation and including um, a lot of things. Uh, when you have what it says other, where there's a D, um, there's no regular arrangement. This right here. 
um, there's no regular arrangement here. If you see it A, it includes sibling. If you see it B, it includes in-home babysitter. Um, if you see a C next to it, um, it includes daycare centers, nursery schools, preschools, Head Start programs, that type of aspects. So I'll just kind of give you guys a, a teeter totter there. But when you're looking at it at married couples and single moms, many differences kind of happen through here, right? On who takes care of the kids, non-relatives, daycares, that type of things, right? When you're looking at single moms, you can kind of see when it comes to moms taking care of the child's it kind of decreases even more because now they are expected to work. Same thing with dads, you know, it goes the same way. Um, but it's one of those situations where the time spent because of a single mother type aspects, it's harder. Um, when you're looking at single fathers who have sole custody of their children, usually because of the mothers have abandoned the children or courts has declared them, you know, unfit parent, however it might be. Um, there's still space to explore some type of like um, detailed um, in regards to the you know traditional type conflicts and difficulties and that type of thing as well in regards for daycare and those types of aspects um, but as you can see when you're looking at this picture um, for single moms they will kind of look for others like grandparents kind of increase other relatives kind of increased, right? Because we rather have our kids go to a relative or a family, you know, some type of a family member because why? I don't charge. Um, just like, a, you know, my situation, I watch my grandgirls as much as I possibly can for my kids so that way they don't have to pay for daycare. Um, daycare is expensive, guys. It's not cheap, you know. If you get a good one, it you know, and, and it's a good one and a cheap one, hey, if you get a good one and and it's expensive, I, yeah, I don't know what to tell you there. You know, it's, it's very hard. It's very difficult. But as we're looking at child rearing, daycare has become the primary socialization agent for millions of children, right? Um, the text explains exactly, you know, or the, the explains how to select superior daycare facilities. I'm not going to go through in regards to how to tell you how to pick a daycare facility. That is all for you to kind of do. Um, but if you think about a daycare facility, you want to make sure of the, the, the aspects, you know, what are they doing? Are they teaching the kids anything? Are they doing arts and crafts? Are they safe with your kids? Are they sanitary? I mean, these are all the things that you have to think about as a parent. Not only that, what other kids are there? What other um, behaviors can you possibly, you know, see raising from your child and, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, when you're looking at a daycare and that type of aspects, you know, the, the facility safe and is it in a safe area and what's the rating, what's the Yelp stuff, I mean, you'll go through it all. This is just all just examples of what you would look for. Um, when it comes to nannies, um, for upper middle class parents, um, nannies have become a popular alternative to daycare. Um, parents love the one-on-one -on -one care, you know, the, the um, not having to drive the child anywhere. You know, nanny comes to the house, nanny may live in the house, th those types of aspects. Um, but there's reoccurring problems. There's tension between the parent and the nanny. There could be disagreements. Um, there could be over discipline styles. There could be jealousy. Um, you know, nanny might overstep her, you know, you know, overstep, step on toes. You know, if you really want to think about it, nanny can kind of have a, a, a slippery slope in there because, you know, especially if they're living in, um, they might be, you know, feel like more of the parent figure than you are actually the parent figure. So nannies can actually kind of be very heartbreaking for parents to kind of deal with. Um, social class um, is another one. Um, it makes a difference in how people rear their kids. And yes, it does. You know, it really depends. Um, if you are in a upper class, you tend to kind of, or upper middle class, children are like um, tender wildflowers that your textbook uses it as. Um, they are, you know, needed carefully. Um, they're nurturing, they're, they're blooming, they're, they're that type of aspects. And contrast views of the world are different. You know, people rear their child's, you know, the way how they are within a social class. Um, you know, you kind of have to have that, you know, 
balance you know sometimes you know people don't have a balance in regards to how to rear their child so it causes conflicts as well um but if you think about it if you're in an upper middle class you know you have more opportunities type of aspects to kind of when you raise your child to to offer your child versus somebody who is in a um a lower end class type of aspects um so the the vision of life is a lot different from the two so that's what the book is just trying to say in regards to social class that there is a difference in regards to how child rearing is done um helicopter parenting these are parents who kind of hover over the children involved in almost all aspects of their lives um, try to make certain that everything goes according to plan um, their plan is called basically helicopter in other words they hover right um, they become common among uh, basically upper middle class parents uh, they want to basically observe every aspects of what their child is doing make every decision for that child that they're doing um, it's you know very difficult for the child to stand on their own because this parent's literally hovering right um think of being in your book gives you a great little venue and i'll read it it says the fresh college graduate on in uh, basically on a job interview things were well and the interview was about to offer him a job when the interviewer mentioned salary, the man said, hold on, I need to call my mom and negotiate. My mom's a good negotiator, so she can negotiate with you. So that's kind of like the default or the downfall, not the default, but the downfall of having a helicopter parent hover. Kids don't know how to make their own decisions. Um, it's very hard for them. Um, the other aspects of helicopter parenting is um, the aspects of having a separation going on in the home as well where now you have helicopter parenting going on you have helicopter parenting going on with mom is in the house hovering over the kids to make sure because when she's there she's there and then when she leaves dad comes in now you have dad hovering as well so now you have two different type of parenting styles going on but they're separated they're still living in the same house they're just not living there together so it's very difficult for these kids to kind of transition to understand like, okay, I have two sets of rules kind of going on and two, two type of parenting styles going on. But at the same time, I have this parent just hovering over me. So it's very hard for these kids to kind of adjust and make decisions on their own because they're almost terrified to make those decisions on their own. When you're looking at family transitions, transitional to adulthood, we talked about this. When does... When does an individual, individual actually transition to adulthood? If individuals are living at home longer and longer, you know, and they're not transitioning out, you know, technically, you know, um, empty nest, you know, that used to be, oh, you know, when, you, when your child turns 18, it was supposed to be they get out of your house and you're an empty nester. It doesn't exist anymore. You know, let's be realistic. A 17, 18, 19 year old cannot live on their own. It just, there's no way, there's no way feasible. Economically wise, there's no way feasible. Um, they would need roommates or if they could plan on doing a higher education and working full time, it just, it doesn't go very well for a 17, 18 and 19 year old. Um, mentality wise, no offense if you guys are in that age, mentality wise, it's very hard for you to consume it all. It's very stressful. So one or the other would have to give. Um, so it's one of those aspects. And we kind of talked about that in chapter three and chapter four type thing. Um, but when you're looking at that transitional, it is older. Um, you know, it's in your later 20s, early 30 type aspects. So we consider that transitional adult. But when we're looking at the widowhood aspects, <clears throat> you know that women are more likely than men to become a widow. It just happens that way. Um, there's two reasons. On average, women live longer than men, and they usually marry men older than they are. And I can't say if this is true or not, but my husband's two years older than me. I mean, it's just it just happened that way. But you know, it is what it is. And <laughs> and then um, for the death of a spouse that ends up at the self, it, it, it tends that it. it um, 
through the years, it just kind of ends up happening. But not only that, um, when you're looking at the 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 death of a spouse or produces it 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 has a widowhood effect. Um, a lot of times, if depending on how long you've been married and how much of a bond that you have and how much of a the the same characteristics that homogamy aspects that you have and you have this such a bond, sometimes it's hard for um, men to kind of move on along you know the vice versa it's hard for men if they are a widowhood to to kind of move on to the next it's the same thing for women um because it's it's that widowhood effect it's you know how can you live without your your significant other some on the other hand remarry immediately and there's no there's no lapse so it just kind of moves but you kind of have this family transition right family tradition to adulthood you know when do you actually become an adult when are you self you know self concept of where you feel comfortable and you're growing and your family's growing and you get all into that and then there becomes a time that you become a widow where you kind of work the other way and now you have to learn how to adjust back down so it kind of gives you the two family transition type aspects you gotta get used to so when you're looking at diversity within u.s families you have a lot of diversities um it's deferred by class it's deferred by single moms, single dads, marrieds, all that type of aspects. Um, they start off this section with African-American families um, in regards to they are least likely to be headed by married couples. Um, they're most likely to be headed by, um, uh, by women. Um, when we're looking at the aspects of it, the family structures in regards to all, in regards to U.S. families, white children underneath the age of 18, headed by both mothers and fathers, um, headed by mothers, fathers, and both parents. You can kind of see there's a dramatic effect in between all of the, the race and ethnicities type aspects. Um, when we're looking at the African-American household, um, it's headed by both mother and father. It is a very low, on here it says 30, mark the right one, it says 39. Um, however, your textbook is 38. And that's the person you need to know. It's 38%. So don't know this. Know that. Don't mind my chicken scratch. Okay. So approximately what percentage of African-American households is headed by both a mother and father? It is 38%. Um, so by all means, uh, the, the percentage is low. As you can see, you have more mothers that are being, you know, single mothers versus, you know, neither parent is even kind of even a high on that aspects as well. <laughs> and then you have the fathers. <clears throat> so when you're looking at like the Asian Americans, they have a high percentage of both parents still in the home. Um, whites, the same thing, Latinos, same thing, and the Native Americans is about on the low side as well. Um, something that my kids' friends were always amazed of is whenever they came over to find both my husband and I in the home, they're like, oh, that's your stepmom. My kids are like, no, that's my mom. Oh, that's your stepdad. Then, no, that's my dad. Both your parents are still together? My kids would be like, yeah. Um, so as nowadays, it's very uncommon to have both parents still in the home. Um, some kids are so used to only seeing one parent or the other. <clears throat> when you're looking at Latinos families, Latino families, they have a, this really close bond in regards to it, right? Um, however, there's a term that is used, and it's, you know, to show that emphasis on male strength and dominance within a Latino family. However, other, you know, as with other groups, there are such things as you know, no such thing as Latino families. Some Latino families speak little to no English. Um, my mother-in-law spoke, you know, spoke Spanglish, um, but she couldn't think of the word in English. She was saying in Spanish, and so it's kind of how I was able to kind of pick up on Spanish throughout my, you know, 20, we, 29 years of being around my husband, you know. So it's one of those things. So while others have assimilated into you as cultures type aspects, um, the extended here the extent here is that when it, even when latinos all get together and they're they're with their own family they speak their culture they speak spanish they speak their native tongues it's just really easy for them 
Um, but you know, Hispanic families are very tight units. They they communicate, they talk, they they do special events all the time. They do you know weekend things. It's just one of those things that they kind of do. Um, but it's still one of those things to where you have the machismos, um, where that has that emphasis on male strength. You know, the male dominance. That is a Latino type thing. Um, there is a male dominance type aspects in regards to Latinos families. That's the part of their culture. When you're talking about Asian American families, um, it is easy to see why there's no such thing as the Asian American family when you realize Asian American is just a general census category. Remember, they're just lumped into one big category, um, you know, because of the many nations, right? So here's, you know, a good example in regards to Asian Americans. They're from Bangladesh, you know, but it's also one of those things. What's their culture, you know, their tradition? What's their, you know, higher education? What is all that, you know, factor into here? Um, their family structure, their lifestyles, their diversity, you know, there's so much there within their, their lifestyles that kind of build their, their physical aspects of their physical appearance as families, right? Um, here's the same thing. They have a very close bond. Um, there's a lot to see. You know, just the differences, tradition versus industrialized type thing. Native Americans, issues of Native American family, they follow tradition or assimilate into a dominant culture, right? They either, you know, conform or they, you know, keep to their normal traditions. It's one or the other um after are often permissive and avoid punishment um and elders are very active in very traditional type aspects um so when you're thinking about native american types aspects you know um th is family is closest to those of like more of a latino and african americans when you're you're thinking of native americans um parents are permissive with their children um they avoid physical punishment um, elders, the elders for like the traditional aspects play a huge role in the child rearing type aspects. They, they are very a part of child care, but also teach the discipline of the children as well. So that's when you're looking at the elder type aspects, um, the Native Americans kind of follow those traditional type things. Um, when you're looking at um, the decline of a two parent family, you could kind of see in 1970 having two parents was very high. Now it's kind of diminishing down. Um, I would like to, because this is just an estimate when the textbooks was done for 2020, um, saying that there's only supposed to be about 67% of children underneath the age of 18 who live with both parents. I would like to know if that's actually true or not. Um, but like I said, it's an estimate. 2010 was accurate, 2020 was supposed to be an estimate. But if you think about it, you know, if four or five children of the divorce uh, live with their mothers, you can kind of see how easily it could, you know, be true in regards to that aspect. And so couples without children. So this is what ends up happening. What's the percentage of what U.S. women aged 40 to 44 that have never given birth? So you can see it by race and ethnicity, and then you can see in regards to the schooling as well. And what happens is, is that couples are infertile. Most of the children's couple have a choice. Um, they've had no children. Um, the term, you know, child-free, childless, um, is actually sometimes very depressing for women. However, for some women who are able to, um, it kind of goes without saying it's, it's, you know, kind of their choice, you know, a lot of times depending on when they get married, depends on, you know, where they're at with their career, if their education is high, if you've gotten a graduate degree, PhD, whatever, it's taking you a while to get there. And then once you get your career started, you know, it's kind of one of those things like, okay, well, my career is going and I don't want to lose my pace going. So next thing you know, you're within this age to where it's like, I'm too old to have kids. So therefore I'm not going to have kids. So it really kind of gives us proportion in regards to women who have never been mothers. It could be either choice. It could be because of infertility. It could be, you know, whatever it might be 
you know, not being married, you know, there's other ways, but, you know, it could be all those factors that kind of go into it. Um, so, you know, if they like to travel the world, you know, and all of those aspects, there's so much that kind of go into that aspects, but never mark in regards to the women of being like, oh, well, you're childless or, you know, you're, you know, child free or don't, don't criticize a woman for that, please. Um, you may not like what the outcome might be. But, you know, that's their choice. It's their, their, their aspects. Um, you also have blended families that kind of take an effect too. The families whose members were once part of other family members. So this is when you have a husband or a man that's been married before that have kids and you have a woman who's been married before and have kids or maybe they were single and had kids. It doesn't matter. Um, but now take this family and blend it together. So now you have siblings from other families trying to get along and now you have also child rearing differences that have ever occurred um it makes it very difficult for families to get along um because you have different lifestyles different socialization skills different type of aspects right so it makes it hard for blended families to mix together and get along with one another and try not to kill one another um, by all means however it also if you're talking about blended families and we're talking about marriages and we're talking about families and stuff like that what does it do for that marriage when this family doesn't blend cohesively right it causes additional stress to that marriage um so a lot of times they end up divorced again because the the kids just are consistently and then you get the disagreements in regards to child rearing and it becomes a big mess um so a lot of times it just it just doesn't work and that's that's okay there's nothing wrong with that so it's it's life not everything's perfect um when we're looking at gay and lesbians you know this is more of a um legal responsibility you know virtually unthinkable a few years ago it's something that wasn't thought of um, but when we're looking at the historical ruling in regards to this of the same sex, you know, legal throughout the United States now, it's one of those situations to, you know, is there a difference in regards to the child rearing type aspects? Um, the concern in regards to society has been, you know, of exposing too many children that are being reared, you know, or, you know, being raised in the same sex parenting. Um, can it worsen emotional type aspects adjustments can it um, not being in a two biological parent type aspects can that cause any type of emotional disturbance or anything like that and throughout the research it's found that they try to answer this question by comparing children of heterosexuals gay and lesbian couples and the latest research um, you can kind of see the results are mixed there's really not a set difference um, so it's one of those situations to where they found that female same-sex um, experience more stress rearing their kids because it goes back to um, the outcomes of the children you know in regards to how they're being raised different parenting styles type aspects the other differences um, for same-sex for males they found that there's um, smaller and less dependable samples type aspects um, so it's a little harder for same sex. So it's not equal when it comes to research in regards to finding that that equal balance mix. Um, when we're looking at the average um, time in regards to marriage and the trends in families and changing the timetables of family life and marriage and childbirth and all of that type aspects when we're looking at this the average age of first-time brides and grooms in the u.s are older than any other time in historical history so as you can see nowadays people are not getting married until they're you know 30s late 20s um, this is this is a historical high. I mean, as average as you can see in 19, even in 1890, it was, you know, for women, it was around 22, 26. 1950s is where it kind of really dropped to where really, it was really low while well, everybody was going off to war. So how to get married before to go to war, right? Same thing here, 1980s. 
you know, Desert Storm War, that's all going on there during that time too, you know, um, so people had to get married, but now as time's going on, you have this aspect of where you have cohabitation that's kind of happening, where people are living together, unmarried couples are living together in a sexual relationship to where they don't feel the need to get married, right? There's no need, there's no rush, there's no aspects in regards to having to get married. So the average ages for first-time brides and first-time grooms are older than any other time in the history of U U.S., okay? As you can see, the ages are very different. I do not fall into these statistics at all, guys. I've been married since I was 18, so by all means. Um, so it's one of those situations the bar graph shows the decrease in percentage of who have been married by the age of 25. 2016 was a very low percentage. Um, I look at my kids and my kids weren't married until they're in their, oh, let's see, my daughter has been married for two years now. She'll be 25. So she got married around 22. So um, my oldest or my middle son got married at 21. So statistically, they kind of fall within this you know time frame in regards to 20 and 24 but even still it's one of those aspects in regards to you know people are getting older and the reason why it goes back to them getting older is because why they want to get their education done they want to get their careers going they want to make sure they're stable before they say i do's but the other issue is cohabitation um like i said the you know people are now living together to to you know, having that sexual relationship without having to say the I do's, it's obviously on a, con, you know, increasingly high. Is it going to stop? No. Um, so by all means, it's one of those situations in regards to this is more common now. Um, it's more um, essential type aspects, but there are some essential differences when you're looking at cohabitation and marriage in regards to that commitment. There's no commitment here. You know, cohabitation, you can leave the relationship at any point. There's no, there's no commitment. There's no, um, what's the other word I want to look for? There's no um, long term. There's, you know, if you really want to think about it, there's, if it's, if things aren't working, it's easier to walk away. Um, so by all means, cohabitation is, like I said, it does, it does work. But then the other question is, does cohabitation make marriage stronger? You would think it would, but in reality, it does not. Cohabitating couples share every day, living together experiences, giving them the chance to work out many problems before they get married. However, couples who live together before marriage, less likely to divorce than couples who did not cohabitate. Um, so it's kind of one of those two things. It turns out that the divorce rates is about the same. Um, so there's really no difference um, in regards to saying, hey, you know what, let me live with this person before I get married to see how they truly are. It, it falls in regards to, you know, um, as you grow as a couple, do you guys grow together? Um, you know, that type of aspect. So cohabitating versus no cohabitation doesn't really make a difference in regards to the two. Sandwich generation, you, there's ways in regards to kind of look at this. A sandwich generation refers to people who find themselves sandwiched between and the responsibility for two other generations. Um, so kind of like typical between the ages of 40 to 55, um, they find themselves kind of pulled in two different directions. I kind of find myself, this is me guys. Um, I'm responsible for two generations. I'm responsible for my moms and my grandmothers. Um, there's times of feeling overwhelmed because it's like one of those things I really want to help my grandmother, but at the same time, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want her in my home. I love her to death, but I don't have the, the time or the means to help her the way I need to help her, you know, but at the same time, my mom's not getting any younger either. So it's, it, you know, increasing those issues with uh, increasing that longevity. So as people are living longer, you're going to end up with more sandwich generations. Um, to where you know the the one in the middle is expected to kind of take care of two different ends so it makes it hard um like in my case with my, you know my my grandmother's still alive my mom is alive there's me there's my daughter and then there's my granddaughter so we technically have a five generation 
in my family right now. So I, I you know, when you talk about a sandwich, I, it, it's there, it's, you know, all day long. So it's very hard. But it's this is going to happen a little bit more and more as time pursues because we have a longevity in regards to our lifestyles. Um, we have a longer lifespans in regards to how long we are living. Sorry, I didn't want to sneeze into the mic. Um, when we're looking at the um divorce and remarrying aspects um we are looking at the ways of div uh, ways to measure divorce how to or what are ways that we can to measure divorce what are ways that we can make sure that divorce doesn't really happen where are divorce is happening the most what is wrong why is you know saying divorce is such a big thing but however divorce rate is about 50% um, out of all marriages. So if you really want to think about it, divorce is, is almost as common as getting married now. And, you know, it's just in the times that we are, we're back in 1950s, 1910s, that type of area to say that you got divorced was a totally different term and totally different meaning during those times. Um, when you're looking at where's the highest divorce rate, where do you think the highest divorce rate is? Nevada right? Um, the highest divorce rate is in Nevada. It, it's really easy to get married in Nevada. You don't even have to get out of your car sometimes, right? Um, it's just one of those situations to where it's, you know, they call them shotgun weddings for a reason, right? Um, not only that, how many people go there and not in the right state of mind, you know, and get married. So Nevada has a very, very high divorce rate. It's a little easier in that state than anywhere else because of all the chapels they do have. So when you're looking at the increase in divorces, you know, when you're looking at from race and ethnicity wise, you know, who does get divorced, you can kind of see there is, there is a trend in regards to it as well. Um, but the figures show the percentage of who are divorced and have not remarried. That's the key there, has not been remarried. Um, and the percentage of those who have ever divorced, right? <coughs> Excuse me. All these race and ethnicity groups are listed by their source. But these, you have to keep in mind, these are divorced individuals who have never been remarried. That's a still high percentage. You know, your book has a lovely little meme it's kind of funny and it says i now pronounce you your second husband and your fourth wife you know it kind of gives you the the ideal in regards to divorce that it's it's really common now but now when you're looking at divorce and mixed and race and ethnicity type of marriages you know marrying outside one's race and ethnicity groups leads to higher divorce rates there's a lot of culture factors race and ethnicity factors that you have to look at it's not easy to deal with a, a mixed racial couple. Um, there's a lot of society. There's a lot of family. Like I said, culture-wise, it's either you conform or you don't conform. Um, marriages between African-American men and white women are most likely to end up in divorce. But it's like, wait a minute. That was more of the acceptable association in regards to the last graph that we saw. That was more society-based. It's more approved-based, right? But yet they also have the high. They end up in a divorce. At a, they're more likely to end in divorce. Um, and I normally ask my students, why do you think, why do you think that is, you know, um, the other one is low rates of divorce occur between Asian Americans and whites and white men and African American women. So you have low rates of divorce occur during those times. Um, so it's, it's one of those situations to where, you know, it, it really depends on the individual in regards to when you're looking at the mixed race and ethnicity marriages. Um, it depends on the relationship. It depends on the individual of that relationship. Uh, it depends on how well they bond together. It's depending on their goals. It's depending if they mesh well together, if their family gets well together. It's a lot of factors that go into there. Um, but however, if you have a family member that's not getting along, it's gonna cause some conflict and stress on your marriage. Um, so when you're looking at the symbolic interaction and kind of some of the um, 
misuse of statistics. You can kind of see as you go through um, what reduces the risk of divorce, some college versus high school dropouts. You know, this is kind of a misuse of a statistics type aspects affiliated with the religion versus none. Um, parents not divorced age 25 or over at the time of marriage versus under the age of 18. Having a baby seven months, seven months or longer after marriage, before marriage, annual income of this aspects. So as you can see, um, you can see marriage is more likely to last for people who go to college, participate in religion, wait until they're married before having children, earn a higher income. These are all factors to make it more. Um, you could also see um, having parents who did not divorce is significant as well. Uh, but these are all just kind of factors that they kind of use for statistical kind of concerns. Um, and I, I kind of laugh. I'm like, okay, um, this one here doesn't apply to me. This one here doesn't apply to me. And when my husband and I got married, our annual income was just a little over than this. But I don't fall into this. And here, my parents were divorced. Um, you know, my marriage has actually lasted longer than my parents have. So it just kind of shows you in regards to the aspects in regards to statistics aren't always true. Um, it just really depends on the individual. However, but when you have the percentages as high as they are, it's just one of those things that's kind of hard not to, to believe the statistics. So it's just one of those things. But how symbols could kind of misinterpret it type aspects. Um, when we're looking at children of divorce type aspects and we're looking at the effects, you know, when you're looking at children of divorce, there's negative effects of those children. Um, there's certain aspects that parents are divorced. They're more likely to have children reared by both parents. You end up with behavior problems. You, you end up with probably poor grades, possible high school dropouts. There's a lot of negative effects that kind of go with this type of thing. Um, what helps children to adjust to divorce is when a child who feels close to both parents make the just, best adjustments, um, they kind of make sure that the child understands the reason why they're getting divorced. Communication is, is key in regards to this aspects. Um, you're making sure that the parents are staying involved in the child's life. It, it helps to the child to adjust. If the child doesn't feel a disruption, within their life, they're going to be okay. Um, but when you have this perpetuating divorce type thing, where the children of divorce grow up um, and marry, they are more likely to divorce themselves. Um, it's kind of one of those things that's that perpetuating, like, you know, over and over again, because that's what they've seen. They've kind of dealt with it. Um, when you're looking at grandchildren of the divorce, it's a ripple into the future, right? If the cycle continues, how do you stop the cycle? Um, there's consequences, there's weaker ties to the parents, there's weaker ties to limiting schools, there's conflicts in relationships, right? Um, and when you look at this, uh, the first sociologist who actually studied the grandchildren of couples who had divorced, right, found that the effects of divorce continued across generations. So they found that um, grandchildren experienced the negative effect of divorce um, is because it's a ripple effect. So it's that continuing perpetuation in regards to it. So it has that weakening ties to the parents. It has that limiting of school because they just don't, there's no desire for it. And there's conflicts within relationships. Um, when fathers, when we're looking at the contacts with fathers with their children after divorce, you could have frequent, which maintains contacts at least once or more a week um, through the years. And then in, sometimes it goes to a minimal um, which is two to six times a year, and then it decreases to where there's very little um, after divorce, but um, decreases through the years. And then you have an increase, which is contact after divorce, but increases through the years, sometimes called a divorce um, uh, active father. In other words, sometimes it takes a little bit for the dad to kind of heal wounds, depending on who initiated the divorce type of aspects. Um, but then again, you know, when you're looking at a divorce type situation, more times than not, a child ends up with mom. Um, so therefore, you know, dads have a hard time, you know, getting 
not so much custody rights, but visitation rights and stuff like that. So it really depends in regards to the court systems in regards to how much time the dad actually gets with the child. Um, depending on the circumstances of the divorce, depending on the, the all of that aspects, that's the reason why you have this type of decrease and increase type aspects. Because usually the increase happens after the child hits age of 18. <clears throat> so there's an increase there. Um, been there, done that. I, my parents, like I said, divorced when I was a young teenager. So it was one of those things that started off frequently, went to minimum, went to decrease. And now that I'm older, it's actually increased. So it's like I said, it's one of those situations to where I've gone through all four of these stages as a kid. And as a kid, just one of those things, it's just, you know, for dads to, to maintain those contacts and, and, you know, keep that bond. There is a bond there with dads and moms and everybody else. So it's one of those things. Um, the ex-spouse uh, filled with anger, depression, anxiety, and relief. Um, the initiator of the divorce recovers faster. So whoever decided that they wanted to get divorced and filed the paperwork will recover faster because they feel this relief. Um, some remain friends. The key word there is some. Um, not all, but some do. Um, when you're looking at the most remain in contact because of children, you know, the, you know, they have to because of some type of arrangements they have to. So you have to have that common um, grounds in regards to it. If you're ex-spouse and you do have kids, by all means, be civil. Um, don't use your, the kids to be the teeter-totter in between. So by all means. Um, the marital history of the U.S. brides and grooms, like I mentioned, the first time marriages is, is higher than at an age. But as you can see, you have a 40% of remarriages, both husband and, and wife, either way, um, 2020. So there is a, a an aspect in regards to saying I do in regards to remarrying again. There's a high percentage there. <clears throat> so there's two sides of family lifestyles, right? You have a dark side of the family lifestyle, which is battering um, children, child abuse, marital rape, incest, you know, there's, there's is a dark side. Um, there is a bright side as well in regards to successful marriages, successful families, that type of aspects. So when you're looking at the, the spousal battering, you know, um, wives and husbands are equally as likely to initiate violence. Um, wives, unfortunately, are the ones that are more likely to be injured, unlike this, excuse me, unlike this photo. But if you think about it, when you're looking about battery and that type of, you know, spousal battery and stuff like that, usually who makes that discretion in regards to who was the one that was being battered by the markings, by that, the story, that type of aspects, it's usually a police officer that kind of teeter totters in regards to weighing out the differences because otherwise than that, it's more of a less of a he says, she said type of aspects. Um, when you're looking at, oops, when you're looking at child abuse, um, child abuse uh, in regards for the U.S. wise in regards to confirmed cases of child abuse or neglect annually. Um, when you're looking at this type of aspects and you're looking at it, there are 700,000, that's a key word there, 700,000 confirmed cases of child abuse and neglect annually for children, right? Um, there's about 2 million reports of children being abused or neglected. There are 3 million children are involved in these types of reports. However, once they go through and these are actually confirmed cases, annually you have about 700,000 out of the billion, out of the million that you'll end up getting reported on. But why we even have a million, over a million being reported on, right? Why should we have any type of that stuff? Um, when we're looking at marital intimacy rate, um, you know, you're looking at that type of aspects. Where would it apply? How would it apply? Is there a um, aspects in regards to intimacy rape? Does it only go to heterosexual or homosexuals? No. Ready? When you propose the term intimacy rape, it would apply to both heterosexual and homosexual relationships. Doesn't matter. You can still have intimacy rape across both relationships. Um, cohabitating, 
that happens in the huge numbers of couples who are doing that um, when you have an intimacy rate partner type aspects. Um, when you're looking at incest, um, it's one of those factors that you kind of look at, okay, it's very unusual, it's against the law, it is illegal to marry your spouse or your siblings or your father or mother or whoever, right? However, in this picture here, this is a couple that is fighting against the Germany courts or European courts that ruled against their challenge to Germany and incest laws, right? Um, they have done nothing wrong, they are in love, um, but they're brother and sister. It, your book kind of goes on and, and gives you more information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in one fourth of the cases of the victims was way younger than the brother, and there's about the 13% of the cases that the offender was the older sister. Um, most offenders between the ages of 13 to 15, um, kind of the aspects in regards for the incest type of thing, and then most victims are 12 years or younger type aspects. But in this case, this couple's this couple here is married. Um, they have four kids. They are fighting the law system, um, Germany law system, to make it legal in Germany. I seriously don't think they'll ever get that passed. However, currently, there are four kids. I do want to say one of my students actually looked it up. Um, and the four out of four other kids, I want to say three of them were um, disabled, special needs type aspects, and they're all four in foster care system. So, you know, their fighting has gotten where, you know, unfortunately it's caused a lot more harm to their kids than it has anything else. Um, however, there is a bright side of successful type aspects, right? When you're looking at successful marriages, um, they did some research in regards to marriages that have been married for 15 years or longer, and they asked all of these, you know, 51 of these marriages that were, you know, out of all these marriages, there was only about 51 that were unhappy um, in regards to their marriage, you know, but out of 300 happy couples, this is what they found out that were very common in regards to um, making a, basically a successful marriage. They said they consider their spouse to be their best friend. You know, they, oh, excuse me, they like their spouse as a person. They think that of a marriage as a long-term commitment. They believe that marriage is scarce. In other words, it's hard to come by. Um, they agree to aim on the same goals. Uh, they believe that their spouse has grown and more interesting over the years. They strongly want their relationship to succeed, and they laugh together. So when you have the successful type marriage, it improves your health right? You're happier, you're not, you're less depressed, um, you're less likely to use drugs, and they have very similar characteristics. Um, when you, they did a study in regards to what makes the future of family and marriage type aspects, you know, what makes a um, happy family, they did a study on 660 families um, in the United States and South America, they found that happy families, they spend a lot of time together, they are quick to express appreciation. They promote one another's welfare. They do a lot of thinking and listening to one another. Um, they're religious. Uh, they deal with crisis in a positive manner. Crisis is not easy to deal in a positive manner. They sometimes are very hard to deal with in a positive manner. But they found that those are ways to make a successful family. Um, the trends in marriage and family life, it's going to continue. Um, one factor to note is considering the future of marriage is that marriage exists in every society. It's not going anywhere. Um, distorting the image of marriage and family, social, uh, sociological research allows us to see how our own family experiences fit into patterns of cultures. But for the most part, it's gonna, marriage and family is gonna continue regardless. It's just part of our society. It's, it exists in every society. It's not going to stop. It is just, it's just our future. It's just the way how things go.